Good afternoon, everyone. I am Mim Rooney, Chancellor of Johnson & Wells University and Chair of the Rhode Island Public Expenditure Council. I would like to thank all of you for joining us today and to extend particular thanks to our RIPEC members who sponsored this event. Now, to kick off today's gubernatorial forum, I would like to welcome our moderator, WPRI investigative reporter Steph Machado, who covers politics in the city of Providence. We are pleased that she accepted our invitation to serve as the moderator of today's forum. Steph? Thank you. Thank you so much, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Steph Machado. I'm a reporter at WPRA 12. Uh, I want to thank RIPEC first for inviting me here today to moderate this conversation, and of course, want to thank the candidates for all being here. Now, RIPEC organized this event with the uh, general topics, as the candidates know, of taxing, spending, the influx of COVID relief money coming into Rhode Island, among other topics, of course. Uh, but I want everyone to know that the list of questions I'm about to ask are known only to me, not to RIPEC or anyone else in this room. So here's how the forum will go. Um, I will ask the candidates a series of questions. You will each have a chance to answer each of the questions. We don't have a hard timer for your answers, but there are six of you here on the stage, so I'm gonna ask you to please be brief, answer the question and answer concisely so that we can get through as many questions as possible in the next hour. Um, and you will have a one minute closing statement at the end and that, is, uh, that will be timed. I'm gonna ask the audience to please not um, applaud or react again so we can get through as many questions as possible. I will give you two opportunities to applaud and the first one will be in just a moment as I introduce our six candidates. Starting to my right, we have former Secretary of State Matt Brown, former CVS executive Helena Folks, Secretary of State Nellie Gorbea, businesswoman Ashley Kalis, our incumbent governor Dan McKee, and community activist uh, Dr. Luis Daniel Munoz. Please give them a round of applause. <clears throat> So I did pick from a hat last night uh, the order in which we will go for the first question, and it is also recorded on video if anyone wants to doubt me. Okay. So we're going to begin with Ms. Kalis. Rhode Island has $1.1 billion to spend from the American Rescue Plan Act yet to be allocated. What is your number one priority that you think this money should be spent on and why? <clears throat> You know, we have a once in a life opportunity to hit the reset button in Rhode Island and we need an outsider to do it. In terms of the $1.24 billion uh, in funding, I am not interested in one time fixes or unfunded commitments uh, in programs. We need to invest in education, competitiveness and housing. In order to choose programs, we need to look at metrics, we need to look at benchmarks, key performance indicators, and standards in order to decide what will give us the best return um, on our money. And Ms. Kalis, your number one priority, please. Number you... one would be education. Thank you so much. Dr. Munoz, same question. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, growing up in Central Falls and then professionally uh, you know, becoming a medical doctor and understanding how the industry works and how ultimately these systems are designed, I think it's more, now more important than ever that we prioritize health care. Uh, we need to invest heavily in community health infrastructure that all working families in the state of Rhode Island are overburdened by. We need to create a sustainable health care system built from the ground up, which also involves allocating dollars towards a free, comprehensive community health, I would say, hub across our five counties. And by doing that, we need to take an active step as a state to ensure that we are controlling the procurement process so that price controls are set so that this for-profit healthcare system that overburdens businesses and working families can finally change. Thank you. Ms. Folks, your number one priority for the ARPA money. Yeah, absolutely. My number one priority is education. I have proposed, it's up on my website, that we spend $500 million of the $1.1 billion on education. Examples of kinds of things that I'd like to see since COVID learning loss is the number one issue we hear about. And just to set the table, we know that 33% of our kids are passing their reading level test scores, only 20% in math. So I will be, and you can see all the details, every item has a dollar amount next to it in 
I know this is a forum of people who love good policy and details, so I've got it all on my website. But things like before and after school learning, summer learning, making sure every K through three classroom has a teacher's assistant, making sure every single school in this state has a guidance counselor, making sure that we are investing in ESL certification. Our teachers today have to pay for it themselves out of pocket. And so I've got a host of things that I'd like to see us close the gap. I think it's both a moral duty we have to our kids and a huge economic opportunity. I recruited so many people to come work for me in my 25 years at CVS. Most of them ended up buying houses in Massachusetts, take advantage of the great public schools, and they drove 30 minutes to work. So I'd like to invest in education, and I think that can ultimately end up driving our economic engine as well. Thank you, Ms. Folks. Mr. Brown. Housing. Um, so we've got a, a, a situation in this state where most people, everyone except the very rich, are struggling to afford housing. The single thing that most of us want to do more than anything else is to be able to provide for our families, including putting a roof over our families' heads, over our children's heads. And for a lot of people, that is a huge struggle right now. Rents. Uh, went up 24% during COVID. That's not tenable. And we have people who completely slip through the cracks. I've met people who are working people. I've met a teacher with her daughter who are living in the car because rents went up and they couldn't afford it and they live in the car outside. So it's not tenable, it's not moral, it's cruel. And our government has taken lots of money and invested it in corporate developers to build luxury housing including the Superman building, including the Fane Tower. $50 million of our money, the people's money, going to corporate developers to profit instead of dealing with the affordable housing issue. So our top priority with the ARPA funds would be to put it toward our program, uh, my and Cynthia Mendes' program, she's running with me as the, for Lieutenant Governor, to build 10,000 truly affordable homes and break the backs of this affordable housing crisis. And we would cap annual rent increases at 4% a year so people can also afford to pay rent. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Secretary Gorbea. Yeah, I actually agree that housing is uh, the way to really focus on solving uh, many of the issues that are transformative. I mean, this is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, right? So we have to use it in a way that's long-lasting. Uh, housing, it turns out, is foundational. A child that moves twice in a school year because the family can't afford a place to live is lost to that educational system no matter how great those schools are. So, so housing gives us the opportunity to improve educational outcomes, to address issues of the environment, because housing is also uh, the reason why we have a lot of heat and electricity related uh, impacts on our environment that housing is absolutely foundational to improving our uh, quality of life and, and be able to invest in an infrastructure that has an impact beyond just today into tomorrow. Governor McKee, your number one priority for the ARPA money. Yes, yeah, so um, during the budget process, uh, there was one, two questions that I asked anybody who, who was going to entertain an idea of how to use those dollars. One was that it couldn't be a program that would need to be funded in the future. And two, it had to show a way that it was going to help with the economy and increasing people's income, which are the main goals that I would say. So, but in the Rhode Island 2030 plan, which I'd like to have everybody go to, ri2030.com, it's a 10-year strategy, a working document in its first edition, just coming from its first draft, and that details what we need to do in the state of Rhode Island, whether it's in housing or education, or it has to do with health care, whether it has to do with the blue economy, the green economy, uh, is, is a very comprehensive report. And my budget uh, mirrored what was in that Rhode Island 2030 plan. The funds that have been allocated in a way that is going to really help our economy, help our education, help our health care, child care, all reflects the 2030 plan. So if you want to know, you know what, I'm, what I'm proposing, what I'm asking the General Assembly to do, uh, the investments will get into more detail in terms of uh, you know, specifically how we're going to invest in the green economy, how we're going to take advantage of, the, of, of a, an economy 
that is uh, opening quicker and faster and recovering and, and than any state in the Northeast. So the economy is central to the issue. But housing is about economy, education is about economy, child care is about economy, jobs and good paying jobs about the economy. And I'll get into more details in terms of specifically how you're going to invest $200 million in the, in the blue economy, $35 million uh, in, in ports in East Providence, $60 million in, in Quonset, uh, $30 million in bioscience, $40 million in, uh, in, in Galilee to, in the fishing industry. And the list continues to go on and on, and I hope to have the opportunity to get into more detail. Thank you, Governor. Our next question is about housing. Rent has been skyrocketing across Rhode Island. My colleague Ted Nisi earlier this week reported rents have gone up nearly 25% in the Providence metro area since before the pandemic, as Mr. Brown already brought up in his first answer. Uh, starting with uh, Dr. Munoz, would you support a cap on how much a landlord can increase the rent on a tenant? This is sometimes known as rent stabilization. Yeah, so I, I think that governors should work with municipalities to determine whether it's um, caps on, on rent, uh, rent control or rent stabilization uh, acts, uh, whether it's locally or, or as a statewide uh, mandate. Um, you know, I also believe that when we think about housing, there's a lot of talk of affordable housing. I know it's the political thing to say, but what about low-income housing? What about public housing? What are we doing to change a culture that we have in Rhode Island that silos out all of these different classes of individuals physically? So when we talk about affordable housing, I don't want it lost from the conversation that we need to do more for low-income housing. We need to work with municipalities and to incentivize them locally to provide more on their end for development, even if it's changing the zoning laws. I think that the way that we can incentivize municipalities around these agreements, even if it's Rent Stabilization Act, is to actually ensure that we're supporting other areas, maybe education infrastructure, maybe allocating more dollars there. But the key with housing is ARPA dollars aren't going to solve the whole problem. We need to be accountable on the state side. Municipalities need to be accountable on their end. And unless we do something now, the next seven generations will not have a place to live. And that is my biggest concern. That is why I'm fighting. And if there's any indication of how misplaced priorities are now, we can look at the Rhode Island Rent Relief Program to see that the disbursement of those dollars to the people that needed them was delayed. I will not be that type of governor. Thank you, Dr. Munoz. Uh, Ms. Folks, rent stabilization. I would not be a proponent of rent stabilization, but I think housing is an enormously important topic in this state. Uh, affordability, I hear it every single day, people feeling like they're being squeezed out of this state at all income levels. And so I have a very specific plan here as well. I encourage you to look at my website that attacks both short, medium, and long term. In the short term, I agree with Dr. Munoz. We got $200 million from the federal government we have only given 100 million of that out for rent relief. I talk to faith-based and community leaders every day who are fighting hard to make sure people have access to rent relief. I propose we uh, introduce accessory dwelling units so that we could expand the supply of housing. And then I also have proposed a $160 million housing bond to increase supply. The fundamental problem we have in this state is we are 20,000 units short of housing. And that is because in the last decade, Rhode Island has produced the least growth in housing per capita of any state in this country. So everything I would do in this particular area to drive affordability is to increase supply, which is ultimately going to help people, and then get the federal money we got from last year out the door immediately to help the people who are urgently in need. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Um, as I said earlier, uh, uh, Senator Mendes and I have a plan to build uh, 10,000 truly affordable homes, including for low-income people, and that, but that's going to take time. And as some of you know, I know many of you in this room, I'm, I've spent most of my life as an advocate and activist running nonprofit organizations. And so I don't really think in terms of election cycles, this is a crisis that is happening right now. And the, where this crisis becomes real for a lot of people, I mentioned earlier, is when rents go up and working people, to be clear, working people, people who are working full time cannot afford it and they end up on the street. And so that's why Cynthia and I went out uh, in the winter and pitched tents outside the State House to demand that Governor McKee and our leader start spending some of the ARPA funds 
because we were facing a situation where we were going to have hundreds of people on the street in the freezing cold through the winter. Uh, it's important for everyone in this room to know that the contracts that were established for that winter crisis are coming up right now, and, and Governor McKee and his administration have no plan, and people are going back out on the streets. The advocates who've been fighting for this, RIHAP, DARE, and others, have been making this case for weeks that this crisis was coming, and nothing has been done, and we're going to be right back where we were. And what I want people to absorb in this room, you all have voices, uh, is how extreme that is in the United States of America that our own people live on the streets. It is, the, it is a policy decision. So it is the policy of the people in power that some of our people live outside. And we all need to own that and figure out what we're going to do about that. And just one last point, I think part of the reason that is perpetuated is because uh, people tell a story that is untrue about people living on the street, that, they, that they're there because there's something wrong with them, they're different, they're less human than the rest of us. Not true. In my work, I've met them and worked with them. My running mate spends every Sunday morning feeding breakfast at the Matthewson Street Church to the unhoused. They are not other. They are us. They are our brothers and sisters, and we need to fight for them. Governor McKee, I want to give you a chance to respond to the criticism from Mr. Brown, and also please tell me if you support rent stabilization. Well, I'll speak to housing. Uh, it's clearly one of the priorities that we have in the, in the budget uh, last year. I had 11 days to do a budget uh, coming into office in an emergency situation, and we were able to put in a funding stream that is going to be an annual funding stream for housing in the, in, in the low-income housing through the conveyance tax and a combination of, of uh, state funds. So we've already got a jump start on that. Uh, go to the Rhode Island 2030 plan. It talks about housing as being a priority, uh, and we have funded that in our budget. One of the things that I realize coming in that there is no written housing plan in the state of Rhode Island. I'll say that again. All the advocates and everybody else at this point in time when I put five million dollars on the table in early fall to take care of the homeless issue and I've made a promise and a commitment if the budget is passed this year that we will build shelter which is not the best housing but is certainly needed uh, for the coldest day of the year. And in, in our budget, there's enough funds that we can do that, and we're partnering in with Rhode Island Housing right now with staff in my office, along with uh, the Rhode Island Foundation uh, to make that happen. But housing is not just, um, it's, it's from homelessness to fair market value. And it's a 39 city and town effort. So Governor, do you support rent stabilization, capping the amount that landlords can increase the rent? There may be a spot for that, uh, but again, without a plan, I think that you're, you're basically picking out of the air, well we'll, we'll, we'll do that, we'll do that. No. You need a plan. In our budget, there is a plan, uh, and we are providing for uh, the coldest day of the year right through determining, you know, I see a lot of numbers, 10,000, 20,000. We don't know the number, ladies and gentlemen. We do not know the number, and we certainly do not know what area those numbers fall in. So we need a plan, there's money in the budget to do that. And, we are, and also, when we have $250 million in the budget, be a comprehensive uh, plan for housing. And inside of that, we're gonna leverage those dollars. We should be able to get at least a billion dollars worth of housing out of that $250 million if we do it correctly. Secretary Gorvea. As the person on the stage that actually worked in housing for a very long time, I'm thrilled to finally see housing issues be discussed uh, in this state. Uh, back when I was executive director of housing work, and I think I mess, met most of you in this room, uh, we argued very convincingly that housing is part of the economic development strategy of this state. Now, there's, you know, I, was, I was proud of the work that we did to make sure that we built a couple thousand of units of housing with the first two housing bond issues, uh, but we've got to do a lot more than just that. Uh, and, and I'm not sure that plans are necessarily what we need. We need action. Um, that with regards to your specific question regarding uh, rent stabilization, I'm not sure we're there yet. I think that what we really need is to loosen the barriers to building of housing. And money is part of it. 
I argued successfully for putting housing into the, into the governor's budget, and I was very glad to see Governor Raimondo take a lead on that. But it's beyond the money. It's, it's the fact that we make it very difficult. There will be plans in the municipalities. This is an area zoned for multifamily housing. And then it takes years for that development to actually have happened. And so what you need is leadership in the governor's office that will work with the cities and towns and will leverage some of the existing dollars that we have right now and, and, and deal with the concerns. Well, we can't, we'd love to build this housing, but we have infrastructure issues. Okay, as governor, I'll say, let's move that money into infrastructure in this community, but you've got to build me that housing. That's how you address housing issues. If it's an educational concern, you move the educational dollars. And that's the trick to public policy issues in solving them. It's that there's no one solution. There's no one silver bullet. I know that that's what people want to hear, but there's not one way of doing it. You have to layer the approaches. You have to hit at it from a number of angles to be able to move things forward. Ms. Kalis, do you support rent stabilization? No, rent stabilization doesn't deal with the problem. The problem that we have is a lack of inventory across the housing stock, so we need to address the issue, which you know is related to the cost of land, uh, so supplies, um, and supply chain issues, which makes it hard to develop, among other things. Uh, so what we need to do is address the problem, which is to create more housing units, and we can do that by taking a pool of money to incentivize developers specifically to work on affordable housing. That's one thing. The other thing is we need to have a better business environment so that we can incentivize growth uh, so that developers will be incentivized to build more units. Mr. Brown, um, Rhode Islanders have been struggling with inflation on everything. Sorry, sorry. Rhode Islanders have been struggling with inflation, everything from groceries to gas. Tell me something specific you would propose as governor that could provide relief. Yeah, and this inflation problem is preceded by decades of a situation in this state where the cost of the basic things people need, not talking about the luxuries, talking about housing, talking about health care, the basic things people need have gone up hundreds of percent, hundreds of percent, while wages have stayed essentially the same. And now we have this inflation over the last months on top of that. What that means is that for most people, most people out there in our state, uh, they are struggling to do what they most want to do, which is provide for their families. And some slip through the cracks. And that's not tenable. And uh, we need to do several things to change that. One is we need to understand, and I, I just want to say, I, this is right, Peck. There are a lot of corporate, uh, corporate leaders in the room, and uh, you've been in a lot of discussions about how to build the economy in this state over, over, over the years. What I want to propose to you all is that the system we've had, the strategy that the people in power have had in this state for a long time, which is to take public money, funnel it to large corporations and the richest people at the top, and to tell us that that money is going to somehow trickle down and benefit middle class and working class people. Uh, Fifteen years ago, the people running things gave a tax cut to just the richest 1%, people making over $450,000 a year. That tax cut alone cost the state $1 billion over the last 15 years, while school buildings are literally crumbling. I mentioned earlier, $50 million for luxury condo development, uh, a million and a half to Amazon, uh, the corporate giveaways from the Commerce Corporation, millions and millions of dollars. Stephen Pryor, who runs the Commerce Corporation, told us over and over those giveaways were going to pay for themselves. We found out a few weeks ago in a government report they did not. It was not true. And meanwhile, after all that spending going to corporations and the richest 1% in our We're going state. Going a little off topic, Mr. Brown. No, totally on topic because instead of, instead of that money going to corporate, corporate giveaways and the richest 1% in tax cuts, we should be uh, investing in affordable housing. We should be investing in health care, not cutting Medicaid a quarter billion dollars like the people running things have done. These decisions have made it harder for people to get by. They have raised the cost of things, and we haven't raised wages, and we also need to raise the minimum wage to $19 an hour. Thank you. Secretary Gorbea, something specific that would uh, provide relief for rising prices. 
Well, one of the things, you know, when this all started, people were really feeling it at the gas pump. And I know that it was very controversial that I mentioned uh, that, you know, we should suspend the gas tax for a little bit. And it was really about speaking to people's pain. I personally know people who were not filling out their gas tanks, uh, tanks because they were waiting to see if maybe prices would go down by the end of the week. And in the end, government has to speak to people. It has to address the issues that they're facing in their everyday lives. Now, a lot of the inflation issues are, are bigger than our state, right? So we need to make sure that we're taking advantage of what opportunities there might be to address the larger picture. And one of them is the global supply chain. I mean, we're post-pandemic. We are having this massive economic uh, crisis in, in, throughout the world. But we're having a global supply chain problem that's also spiking the prices. You know, I, I see Dave Shenevert from the Manufacturers Association. We should be doubling down on manufacturing in our state to provide Rhode Island companies with that opportunity to help solve some of these issues. That kind of uh, opportunity is something that I don't think is really being taken care of. To be clear, are you still, are you still calling uh, to suspend the gas tax? And if so, where would you make up that revenue? So it's, it, we're only talking, first of all, right now we have a lot of revenue, right? In fact, for dealing with the pandemic as well. So I would use some of the existing uh, pandemic-related funds for that. Um, and we're talking for a short time period. And we then have to double down and say, this is the reason why we need to move to alternative energy. It's a moment in space and time to say, I hear your pain, and as a result, I'm doing this in the very short term, and I'm going to now also work diligently and rapidly to make sure that we have alternative energy being developed and opportunities for people to use that here in Rhode Island. Governor McKee, something specific that could help with the rising cost of gas and groceries and so on. Yeah, so this gives me a good opportunity to talk about the budget. Um, well over $600 million surplus. We're waiting on the May revenue, which is going to increase that. Uh, it's my first budget. I, I, I um, propose budgets to break even, and I manage budgets for surpluses. And we're using those surplus dollars in a very intelligent way. We'll take a look at where we are in, in the May dollars and determine where there might be more rent and leave over and above what I've already got proposed in the budget which uh, helps small businesses, uh, again, the vehicle phase out. Rhode Island is going to be a state for our business community as well as our residential that's not going to have a, ga uh, not going to have a car tax. That's a, that's a major um, a pivotal uh, play that was started uh, before I was there, and we are, we're continuing doing that process. Um, so it's a matter of being smart about how we use the surplus dollars. Right now, $100 million we're going to use to bring in $400 million of infrastructure dollars, uh, and we're going to continue to do it that way. Short-term fixes are not going to work. Jobs are really important. Increasing people's income is important. In our budget, we have over $40 million for job training that's going to help do that, uh, and, and that can happen very quickly because we know that uh, Fidelity is looking for 800 people. I just met with FM Global. I know they're hiring. We know, uh, we know down electric boat they're hiring. The idea right now is to get people employed in high paying, the highest paying jobs and getting their skill sets up. So we'll take a look at where we are. Uh, but again, that's a significant surplus that we were able to manage our way to. Next year we'll do the same thing. And we'll use those dollars uh, to uh, take care of cans that have been kicked down the road for far too long. So we're, we're going to continue to work. And the, the other piece I want to say, I, it's in order to get things done, you need to be able to work with people. I see municipal leaders in the audience here. We'll bring the municipal leaders together. But one of the things that I've done, and, and thank to the speaker and the Senate president, is that I we meet weekly during session with them, and we talk about these specific things. So on that particular question that was asked, we're going to take a look at what we got in the May revenue, which is coming out next week, and then we're going to propose uh, some level of immediate uh, tax relief uh, to the people in the state of Rhode Island uh, where it makes sense. Uh, but we're not going to use dollars that can invest in the long-term future of the families that live in the state of Rhode Island uh, and use those unwisely. 
Ms. Kalis, I've heard you say that the rising gas prices are part of what prompted you to run. What would you do to try and relieve this? They're definitely something that I hear about, and inflation is hurting working families. So I would be for uh, suspending the gas tax or anything that is flat in nature because that's a regressive fee or tax, uh, and it hurts working families the most. That's a short-term solution, short-term relief. We also need to look at long-term solutions to deal with inflation, because that, that's what we need to do. And in order to do that, we need to grow. Uh, in order to grow as a state economically, we need to be more competitive. We need to have a better business environment. It is the only long-term way that we can deal with this issue. Uh, Dr. Munoz, what would you do to relieve inflation? Yeah, I just want to start by saying I believe that healthcare is a human right, housing is a human right, and education is a human right. But how do we ensure that these rights are actually accessed if we are not putting money into building people up? Bobby Kennedy once said, as long as there is plenty, poverty is evil, and I certainly believe that. Money gets printed and printed, and it keeps going to corporations, to the top 1% if you look at the people making the biggest salaries in those corporations. Why isn't it going to the people? So it's not an issue of money, though. Inflation certainly is an indicator that it continues to get printed. It's not just a supply issue, though. It's a demand issue. So with market dynamics, we have willingness to pay. And the Fed can try to increase interest rates now, which is only going to make it harder for working families, but it's not going to stop the pending recession that we're faced against. So it's not just inflation. It's mismanagement. It's misallocation of priorities. It is a lack of moral judgment in government. So I believe that we need a supplemental wage program. Use ARPA dollars, create a pipeline out of poverty for families right now that cannot afford to live. That supplemental wage program may be temporary, but if we connect it to Rhode Island Promises program, we can help people build skills, we can support the micro businesses that are employing those minimum wage earners, and we can ensure that the workers themselves have one job instead of three. That the single mothers, like my mother, who was raising five children without any help, have an opportunity to thrive in the state of Rhode Island. Thank you, Ms. Folks. Yes, I have already proposed a $500 middle class tax cut, and I would uh, give this uh, one time tax cut to everyone in the state earning $100,000 or less. I think it addresses the immediate concern that people have around costs and inflation and the price of living in the state. Uh, and it uses part of the surplus that we have right now. So let's use some of the money to get back in people's pockets. I think it's a better proposal than a gas tax cut because it helps people who may not be driving or may not have cars. So there are 400,000 people in the state who would get this, and a, a couple both earning under $100,000, it would be $1,000 back in their pocketbooks. Um, I want to get to sort of the news of the week on reproductive rights. Uh, it's been top of mind, of course, following the news that the U.S. Supreme Court has drafted an opinion that would overturn Roe versus Wade. There's been a renewed push in Rhode Island to cover abortions as part of both the state Medicaid program and in health insurance coverage for state employees. Secretary Gorbea, do you support this legislation? Look, uh, rights that can't be accessed are not rights. And I absolutely support and, has, and have testified uh, on multiple occasions in support of allowing the use of Medicaid dollars as well as state employee insurance plans to cover uh, abortion, because abortion is health care. It's up to that woman, that person, to, to be able to choose, you know, what is the medical care that, that she might need. And so, absolutely. Governor McKee. Yes, I, I, I support that as well as, um, um, as well as making sure that a woman's right to choose is protected. So I've already, you know, we, we're on the record doing that. Letters are going in. And I think under the current circumstances, look, I don't think anybody would ever thought that, you know, what Trump and uh, McConnell did in terms of stacking the Supreme Court would lead us to this point in time. And Governor, do you so, plan to? So I would say that, um, you know, we got we to really take a close look at responding to that as a state. Uh, I do support the, um, uh, the cost of a, uh, you know, the, the cost of an abortion, uh, you know, with the, with the um, state and the state budget. And when that gets passed, I've already told the people who sponsor it that I'll sign the, I'll sign the legislation. I've, I'm having a little bit of trouble hearing you, Governor. Do you, um, I think we have an audio issue, but will, do you plan on submitting a budget amendment that would provide this coverage to the proposal you already submitted? 
Yeah, well, that we, we would cons under the current circumstances of what happened in the last week, I think that the antennas are up, and we'll take a look at that. But I think that I, 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 we're encouraging the General Assembly to uh, pass the legislation, and then I would sign it. Ms. Kalis, should the state cover abortions? I am uh, pro-life, and I want to also say that the right to an abortion is codified in state uh, law. Nothing changes uh, based on this in Rhode Island and for Rhode Islanders. Um, the decision was personal for me. I uh, was preeclamptic in all three of my pregnancies, and uh, my oldest son, uh, Leo, was born at 37 weeks and was uh, four pounds and something. And he was my baby, and he uh, was always my baby. I also struggled uh, with IVF. Uh, so life is a, is a personal issue, uh, but that doesn't change where the state is or the rights that people have according to the law. I do not support extensions any further uh, of the law, but I can also count votes. Dr. Munoz, state-funded uh, abortion care. Women will always have autonomy over their health. Reproductive health is a human right just as much as health as a whole is a human right. No one should ever threaten that. We've had a history in this country, even in the 60s, of taking control over a woman's body. Sterilization programs, no one spoke. Indifference for years. We will not ever allow that to happen. And anyone that is against providing comprehensive coverage, including for reproductive health, for abortion, is actually propelling us into the same narrative, the same dystopian future. So I support legislation that provides coverage. Thank you. Ms. Folks. Absolutely. I, I am uh, firmly uh, in support of the uh, proposal and, and want to make sure that a third of the people in this state get their health care through Medicaid. And I don't think that your insurance should allow us to decide whether you get an access to an abortion or not. Thank you. Mr. Brown. Uh, yes, I do. Um, we were talking, my wife and I were talking with our two kids at dinner last night, and I was saying, when we grew up, I don't think many of us ever thought we'd see this day where the right to an abortion was um, taken away. It is a crisis. It's a personal crisis happening for people across this country right now, this news, and it is a crisis for uh, uh, basic reproductive rights going forward. The question is, what do we do about it? And there are two things we can do in this state. One is to right away pass the EACA and I've got to say, um, Governor McKee, I, I do not understand what there is to look at. This bill was submitted last year. We know what it does. It's very simple. It, it, it makes the right to an abortion real in this state. It's not a real right if people cannot afford it and get access to it. So uh, if I were governor, it would be in my budget, and I'd be pushing as hard as possible to make it happen. The second thing we need to deal with here is the politics in Rhode Island. I mean, this issue, like many things, are tied to politics. And we did pass in this state the reproductive, um, the RPA, um, a couple of years ago. But we need to re understand how fragile that is. That was a long, long fight led by activists and organizers, the Women's Project and many others. It was passed over the objection of Democratic leadership who opposed it. Many Democrats or who are, have a pro-choice platform, a pro-Roe v. Wade platform, who opposed codifying Roe v. Wade are still in office. They need to go. Uh, I will say right now I will not endorse and will not accept any endorsement from any elected official who is opposed to codifying Roe v. Wade and who opposed it in that vote a couple of years ago, and I would expect and hope that my fellow candidates on the stage would make the same commitment. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Uh, I'm looking for a fairly quick response to this one. Um, several lawmakers have proposed creating a new tax bracket for the highest earners in Rhode Island. One bill would charge 8.99% tax rate for income above $500,000. Uh, Governor McKee, would you support taxing the wealthiest Rhode Islanders more? I thought I presented two budgets to the General Assembly, and neither one had any broad-based tax increases. Uh, this is not the way to go. What we need to do is we need to raise people's incomes, uh, and uh, that's what the focus that I have in the budget. I would go to, again, go
go to ri2030.com. Uh, this is not the time to be raising taxes as we're coming out of the pandemic stronger than any state in the Northeast right now. I want you know, the audience to know that. Uh, and when was the last time that the state of Rhode Island uh, wasn't the first in and last out of these economic downturns? It took us seven years to get through the real estate problem in 2008. Today, we're leading the, the Northeast, and we've been in the top 10, in the, 10 on average in the country. So this is the time to double down on the economy. This is the time to invest our dollars to create good paying jobs. Not tax your way into a situation where you just continually increase the cost of, of living in the state of Rhode Island. We have this opportunity right now to reset the state of Rhode Island. In order to do that, we need to talk about reducing the need without causing pain on those who have need. We have 350,000 people on Medicaid right now in the state of Rhode Island. Thank you, Governor. I Those think numbers do not question. work. So taxing at this point in time does not make sense when we're leading the country, you know, the Northeast in terms of an economic recovery. Let's take full advantage of that and reset the state of Rhode Island in a way that we all can afford to live here. Thank you, Governor. Ms. Kalis, would you raise taxes on the wealthiest Rhode Islanders? I think that we need to look at it more, but generally I am not for things that make us less competitive regionally, and this would uh, increase the tax rate um, for Rhode Islanders, and, and I just don't think that it is a great idea. Thank you. Dr. Munoz. If we want to do something to help people, let's have some exemptions for tangible property tax for micro-businesses. Let's have a progressive tax that, yes, taxes the top 1%, because 95% of people that don't fall in the gray area are living paycheck to paycheck. When it comes to that you know, progressive tax structure, I think it's important to recognize that in 2018, Governor Raimundo signed into legislation a pass-through company tax law that allows the wealthiest to get credits against the companies that they're setting up to provide them with some additional income. So there are already loopholes in place for people to benefit. We need to close lo those loopholes, and taxing more to the top 1% is one way. Thank you. Ms. Folks. No, I would not be in favor. Right now we have a very big surplus in this state. I don't think we should be raising taxes, and we do want to be competitive with the other states. I will say that on a national level, I am very open to and, and would fully support making sure that billionaires get taxed more, that making sure that corporations are paying their fair share so we do have good services like uh, child care and, and, and prescription drug prices. But in the state of Rhode Island, we need to be competitive. We have a, a surplus at this moment, and I would not be raising taxes. Mr. Brown. I can't understand the line of reasoning uh, by which politicians, people running for office, lament that we have a struggling economy and we need to do something about it, and then what they advocate for is exactly what we've been doing for 40 years. We've tried the massive tax cuts to the rich economic approach. I, you know, I mentioned earlier, we gave a tax cut to the wealthiest 1%, so that's people making over $450,000 a year, uh, are the people running things, gave that tax cut. It cost the state a billion dollars. And so I know there are some people here, I'm sure, who are in that category, but do you really think that was good economics? Did that really work out well? And for people who take the perspective, if you're, you know, the way you think about it is what's the perspective from a business standpoint, how does a business, particularly a small business, survive when the people in the state have no money to spend? Because we've given it away to the wealthiest 1%. We've given it away to corporations. And people's wages have stayed flat and their housing and health care costs have gone up. That, to me, is really bad economics. It's not going to work. We need to build our economy not from the 1% down, but from workers up. We need to bring down the cost of housing, bring down the cost of health care, raise people's wages, guarantee a minimum wage increase of $19 an hour so people actually have money to spend. And some of those people will then start small businesses. That's how we build the economy. We've tried it the other way, to be clear. And I would hope we could all agree by now that the trickle-down approach is a failure. It doesn't work. Thank you. Secretary Gorbea. Yeah, look, um, if you're doing better off in life, you should pay more. 
than if you're not. That's sort of a simple way of looking at these things. Um, the truth of the matter is, is that before we got all the federal monies, we had structural deficits going on in this state. Now, some of that is better, we need to do a better accounting of, our, of how we're using our state dollars, but we have been cutting taxes to the point where possibly we honestly can't afford what we need to do going forward. And so I would support uh, taxing uh, at, at higher levels of our incomes here in the state, both individuals and, and corporations, but I would do it in a way where we actually target those monies and you know where it's going because I think that's the real disconnect. If any of you come with me and walk in the shoes of people who honestly can't afford to live in this state, you would agree. And I know because I know the people in this room, you're good people. You would agree to help those people out because you see them struggling. And one of the ways that we do that in government is by taxing. It's as simple as that. Thank you. I want to get to a rapid fire section. This is my favorite part. Um, what I'm looking for from each of you is a one or two word answer so we can get through a bunch of questions and see where you all stand. And we're going to go right down the line. Um, so starting with Mr. Brown, right now Rhode Island offers free tuition through the Rhode Island Promise Scholarship at the Community College of Rhode Island. Should that pro program be uh, expanded free tuition to Rhode Islanders at all three of our public colleges and universities, yes or no? Yes. Ms. Folks. I would expand that for uh, nurses and teachers is how I would expand that program across all the universities. Yes, should the Promise program be expanded to all three of the colleges? Um, yes, I'm willing to look at that, but I actually want to propose something a little bit different, which is... Quickly. Okay, not everybody can go to college right after high school. Why not save a Promise credit to be able to be used later on in life when you've gone out into the work world and suddenly you need to upgrade your skill sets. And so I think that that to me is more appealing than necessarily right now expanding it across the board. Ms. Kayla, should we have free tuition at all three of Rhode Island's public colleges? I would want to look at it more and I want to echo the, the need to also um, have options in trades um, and technical training as well. Governor McKee. So I signed the College Promise extending it uh, for CCRI and I think that's a really good thing to do. You'd have to take a look at the numbers to see what it actually would cost uh, before you actually move, you know, said yes or no to that. But one of the things we will be doing is rebranding Rhode Island College. Uh, and I can see at that school a, 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 a way to, to um, fund the junior and senior year. Dr. Munoz, free yeah, tuition. Based on vision and values, we should expand it and simultaneously ensure that those that are part-time, non-traditional students can access the program while bringing all Rhode Island jobs program within Rhode Island Promise. I want to stay on you, Dr. Munoz, still on rapid fire. Who should be the next mayor of Providence? <laughs> I'm going to let him fight it out, and we'll figure out who wins in the end. Okay, Governor McKee? Yeah, I think that's a good answer. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Ms. Kalis. I'm sitting this one out, too. Secretary Gorbea. I live in North Kingstown, but uh, yes, one of the candidates worked with me, and I have a deep regard for him. Wow, we're all aligned so far. I'm with the group. I, I would hope somebody on this stage would be mayor of Providence. Anybody? <laughs> anybody? <laughs> no, I don't, well, I'm apparently not, uh, the endorsements we'll pass, are all, we'll pass, we'll uh, they're all up for grabs, apparently. Yeah. Um, uh, Mr. Brown, I'm looking for a dollar amount. What should the minimum wage be in Rhode Island? $19 an hour, which is just about $40,000 a year. Ms. Folks. Today it's twelve twenty-five. I would accelerate the move to $15. Secretary? I think we're on the path right now to go get to 15 and we need to get there. Ms. Kalis? Yeah, I agree that we are on a path and we shouldn't uh, deviate from the path. $15 an hour is a good start, but that's not enough money for people to actually earn a living. Well, that's why we're going to invest $40 million in job training, and we're going to invest dollars to, uh, to in a, and I hope that I get a chance to talk about the education program that, that's in play, that we're putting in play. But yes, $15 an hour is a, is a minimum wage, but it's, it, you can't raise a family on $15 an hour. We all got to understand that, right? So we've got to have ways to increase income, and that's one of my... Uh, top priorities in the state of Rhode Island is to east increase income so families can afford to live here. That is, a, uh, that is a fundamental way, by the way, to address some of the housing issues that we have. Thank you. Dr. Munoz. Yeah, minimum wage is a poverty trap. However accelerated it is, if it's not getting to 25, people still cannot afford to live. So we need to supplement wages with a supplemental wage program to get to a livable wage. What's the number? 
Yeah, so the number, I, I would, our goal should be $25, however long it takes met with the supplemental wage program to ensure that single mothers in this state, single parents, can afford to live here and raise their children. Okay, staying on you, Dr. Munoz, when it comes to the law enforcement officer's Bill of Rights, would you repeal, reform, or keep it the same? Repeal. Uh, we have a, a state accreditation process that going it, rapid. It assesses. <laughs> Sorry? So, repeal. We're going rapid. So repeal next up. Uh, repeal, okay. What's the question? When it comes to the law enforcement officer's Bill of Rights, would you repeal it, reform it, or keep it the same? That's the police? Yes, the policeman's yeah, Bill of Rights. Is some, some I'm, I'm in favor of the reform that's currently in place. Thank you. Ms. Kalis? I would want to look at it a bit more. Okay. Ms. Secretary Gorbea? Reform. Reform? Reform. Yes, folks? Mr. Brown? Repeal. We have a constitution that applies to all of us equally. Um, Mr. Brown, if one of the other candidates on this stage wins the Democratic primary, do you pledge to endorse them in the general election? Yes. Ms. Folks? Yes. yes. Secretary? I'm going to let you out of this relevant. one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you get a primary, uh, uh, another candidate, I will ask you that question. Uh, Governor McKee? I support Democrat candidates. What's the question? I'm sorry. If uh, another one of the Democratic candidates on this stage uh, wins the primary, will you endorse them in the general election? As long as they're consistent with the values that we all represent on this stage by the time we get there. Okay, that sounds like a maybe. Um, uh, Dr. Munoz, what current or former elected official do you most admire? Bobby Kennedy, the last 90 days of his life. Governor McKee? Uh, Barack Obama. I'm going to lean into Governor DeSantis. Secretary Gorbea? Mm -hmm. That's a tough one, actually. Um, I actually really um, enjoyed reading about um, a former governor of Maine, um, Joseph Sh Chamberlain. Uh, if anybody's seen um, The Fallen Angels, he was a governor who walked with his troops, and I really loved that part about him. Ms. Folks, FDR. Okay, Mr. Brown. John Lewis. Okay, our last uh, rapid fire questions. My favorite, Mr. Brown, what is your favorite Rhode Island State Beach? State Beach. Uh, Tappan's Beach. Okay, Ms. Folk. Town Beach, I'm a Narragansett Town Beach kind okay, of girl. It's a town beach, but we'll let you have it. So I'm really fortunate that I live in North Kingstown, which has many, many beaches, and uh, I don't go to the state beaches. I actually walk to the beach uh, through one of the coastal access points which is why I firmly believe that people should have access to the shoreline. Second beach in Middletown uh, at, uh, after 2 p.m. after camp when it's empty and my kids can go boogie boarding and get attacked by seagulls. So. Thanks. Governor McKee. Yeah, Newport's great. Dr. Munoz. Take Ives Road, past Goddard Park and Potawatomi, and there's this little community beach right at the end. I'll have to check it out. Um, we're now going to get to some of the questions that our audience members submitted while they were having lunch. Thank you so much. We'll probably only get to um, one of these. Um, and we're going to start with Governor McKee. Um, what are your thoughts on lowering income taxes given the current budget surpluses? I think right now, I think you should be looking at other areas of your have the flexibility. The sales tax is something I think you should be low, you know, looking at lowering uh, the income tax. My my thinking is that right now our competition is is our bordering states, Connecticut and Massachusetts, and we should be level in the playing field between those states, two states, as our first option. Right now, we're competitive on our income tax with both those states. So my feeling is you should go look at areas like I like we have in our small business. A friendly budget item, which is talking about motorcycle trade-in values not being offset on sales tax in Rhode Island, but uh, they are in Massachusetts and Connecticut. So we're putting that in the budget. So I think you have to kind of find these areas where you can level the playing field uh, competitively in the tax structure between uh, Massachusetts and Connecticut. And then that's the starter, and then you move from there. You mentioned the sales tax. Should we look for a proposal from you soon, Governor, to lower the sales tax? I think we should be looking at being competitive with all, both Massachusetts and Connecticut. They have a, they're about three, three quarters of a percent lower on the sales tax right now, and I think that's something that we should be looking at. Dr. Munoz, on the income tax. Yeah, I think we should talk about extending child income tax credit. I think we need to focus on credits to support working families in the state to be very targeted in our approach. Mr. Brown, you think we should lower the personal income tax? No. Uh, Ms. Folks, 
I proposed, as I said before, a $500 tax credit in a, a one time to help people through the period we have. And beyond that, I wouldn't be proposing to lower any other taxes at this moment. Secretary Gorbea. Yeah, no, I, um, you know, before this pandemic, again, we had a structural deficit going year after year after year. The pandemic monies are not necessarily something that we should be using to do long-term cuts until we get our house in order. And I look forward to making sure that we do that. Ms. Kalis. We need to look at all taxes. We were ranked 40th by the Tax Foundation in terms of the state tax climate. I think we need to look at all taxes and uh, figure out a, a better way to tax that makes us more competitive or not. Well, thank you all so much. We didn't get through all of the questions I wanted to ask in the short hour we had together, but you are each going to get a one minute closing statement and our timer is Lauren right there. So she, this is the one part of the event that is actually timed. And so your one minute closing statement, Ms. Folks. Okay, great. Well, it's terrific to spend time. I'm, I'm gonna introduce myself because many of you don't know me, but I was born and raised in Providence, the oldest of five kids. And I came back here after school to work in Woonsocket at CVS. And I spent 25 years there. Over that time, I had four kids very quickly and got cancer. One of the reasons I'm running is I realize people are one hazard and, and terrible episode away from uh, really struggling. I'm very proud of the decision I got to lead to get rid of cigarettes in all of our stores. And I think it shows the kind of leadership that I bring. You can hear today I'm focused on education, affordability, and we didn't talk enough about driving a great economy. It's very important to me. But I think at the end of the day, I'm not a politician. I've never been one, but I know how to get things done. And that's absolutely what I would love to do for the state of Rhode Island. Mr. Brown. So I've outlined some of the things I think we need to do. I don't think they're a mystery. We need to raise people's wages. We need to build 10,000 affordable homes so we can break the backs of the affordable housing crisis. We need to restore the Medicaid funds that were cut and move toward a Medicare for all style system that takes profit making out of providing health care. We need to tackle the climate crisis. We need to shut down the polluting fossil fuel industries in the Port of Providence that are choking the children there, mostly black and brown neighborhoods. So we know what we need to do, uh, but nobody can do that alone, uh, which is why I'm not running for governor alone. I'm running along uh, Senator Cynthia Mendes in partnership running for lieutenant governor, and not just that, we're running alongside a whole slate of candidates. These are nurses, teachers, social workers in the Rhode Island Political Cooperative. These are the people who've been doing the work of caring for and fighting for our communities for a long, long time. And so this is a campaign not just to win the governor's seat, but to win a whole new government so we can get these done for the people of our state. Thank you. Secretary Gorbea, your closing statement. Yeah, hi, I'm Nellie Gorbea, your Secretary of State. You've come to know me uh, because I've also worked with you in so many other issues like housing, education, all sorts of issues. What you get with me is someone who knows how to make government work well. A lot of you over the years have told me how you were able to vote well, safely, securely, how you were able to start businesses, that you love the way my office works, that the lobbying system is clear and concise and transparent. Those are the things that we need in our government. I have the leadership skills, and you've seen me work on these very hard issues and deliver results. So when I say that I'm going to grow our economy, that I'm going to do it by making housing affordable, making sure that education in our state is a quality service, and that we solve climate change issues, you can count on it, because you've seen me do it before in other places. Thank you. Governor McKee, your closing statement. Yes, first I'd like to thank RIPEC uh, for putting on this forum and, and saving my chair as I was deciding how do I would get here, so thank you so much for that. And, but let's, let's, let's go back uh, to, to when I was first sworn in as office, where we were as a state. We had some of the highest death rates in the country. We had some of the lowest vaccination rates in the country. Harvard had just given us an F. It's tough to get an F from Harvard. Since then, we have the best vaccinated state in the country because of our municipal leaders, because we activated our firefighters, because we activated our rescue and our school nurses. And because of that, we reopened our economy faster than anywhere in the, anywhere in the Northeast. We have momentum. Let's take advantage of that momentum. And I'd like to just share with you what Dr. Jha said when he was asked at a, men, a child mental health um, forum. When are we going back to 2019? The question was asked. 
We're not going back to 2019. We have an opportunity in this state to come to a different spot, a better spot, and let's take advantage of the momentum that we have been able to cover over the last 14 months. Thank that's, you so much for having time. me here today. Thank you, Governor. Um, Ms. Kalis. Rhode Island needs a fighter, now more than ever. COVID brought front and center the haves and the have-nots, and every day it's getting harder for working families. As a mom of three school-age boys, I understand the struggle. And for me, I am a problem solver. I saw firsthand through delivering vaccines and tests how government does not serve the people. And I'm all about holding people accountable and getting things done. I believe in benchmarks, standards, key performance indicators, and the law. And that is what I will do as governor. I will hold people accountable and I will deliver results. Thank you. Dr. Munoz, your closing statement. Yeah. Thank you so much for the opportunity. You know, John Gardner once said, the primary role of a leader is to keep hope alive. Growing up in Central Falls in an urban core city here in Rhode Island that was 17% in terms of positivity rates for COVID-19, what I learned is that the way you keep hope alive is by fighting. And I have proven that I am willing to fight administrations that will not stay in alignment with the moral principles that we talk about here today. We saw inequities widening during COVID-19, but they were present. Who was speaking about them then? What will we do today for the next seven generations? What will we do today for the next 10 years? If we do not allocate ARPA dollars effectively to not just create programmatic changes around education, but to ensure that we are working with municipalities to solve the housing crisis, then from my perspective, the person who experienced homelessness, who had a father who struggled with addiction, who saw a single mother struggle, knows that nothing will change. And that's why I'm running. That's why I'm fighting. And I will never stop fighting. Thank you. Round of applause, please, for our candidates. Thank you. Well, it was a short hour, but I want to welcome um, Mim Rooney back up. On behalf of all of us at RITEC, I want to thank all the candidates for being here today and engaging in such a thoughtful and compelling discussion. Thank you as well to the RITEC members who sponsored this event, to all our business, government, and community partners, and to all of you for joining us this afternoon. Steph, we have a gift for you to say thank you.